This is Christian Buckley uh, doing another Microsoft MVP Buzz Chat interview, and I'm here today with Martin. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon for me. I'm in uh, I'm in the UK. Oh, I do work um, US hours. My team are in the US. So, well, what, so why don't you give us yeah. that background? Who you are, where you are, what you do, and your company, all that good stuff. Yeah, so sure, yeah, so so as you were saying, my name's Martin. Um, I actually work for a managed service provider um, who are headquartered in the US. They have a presence in, in Europe as well, called Insono. Um, they work across the full stack of uh, technologies, all the way up from mainframe, doing managed mainframe, uh, private cloud, and then all the way into public cloud. And I sit in the public cloud team, uh, for me specifically on uh, Microsoft Azure and, and DevOps, they're my main focus areas. Um, and yeah, I, I work, or the team I work with is based in the US, I'm in the US consultancy group. So yeah, my my hours are, are kind of odd, <laughs> I guess, for uh, anyone that is in the, in the UK. Um, but I basically work early afternoon till, till late evening. Um, well, but yeah, in this, er, in this era, though, we're all working from home and online. You know, that's not exactly. so weird anymore. We're all working whatever hours we're working, continuously <laughs> yeah. working, yeah. Yeah. What, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I mean that's basically uh, me. So yeah, the, the key, key areas for me, uh, uh, from a technical perspective, um, Azure uh, as a cloud technology. Um, although as an organisation, we actually do do AWS as, as well. So we we sit across both of the major uh, players within there and provide managed services around all of those things that I. I uh, just talked about, um, but yeah, my primary areas are, are actually from a technology perspective, um, and then um, the, the the very broad and large subject that is DevOps. Well, and I know you just became an MVP, so congratulations for that. Yeah, thank you. So it was uh, a few days uh, before or before this. So. Um, it, brand new, brand uh, new. That's right. Yes. Yeah, new, new, brand new. That's right. So yeah. Um, it's it's obviously it's been something that I've uh, been I would say working towards because I don't I don't think you really work towards uh, an MVP. It's a it's a recognition for the work you do outside of your day job, right? The key thing about being an, uh, becoming an MVP is it's all about community work, and yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think as well as it being a lot of hard work for you to actually get to the point where you can be someone can feel like they can nominate you for an MVP. I, I think it takes the work after that as well to, uh, you know, not only get the nod from Microsoft to say, yes, this this guy or girl is absolutely worth um, giving an MVP to, but then you've obviously got to maintain it because you were re-selected every year, basically. So yeah. um, it basically goes to recognise the, the outstanding contributions that you make to the community so whether that's speaking engagements blogging blog, uh, podcasts or videos um, uh, so basically giving back to the community but it's stuff that you do on top of your uh, day job so it's not a recognition um, by Microsoft for how good you are doing Azure for your customers or your clients or whatever, whichever it is um, it's basically that it's, it's that above and beyond stuff that you uh, that you, you do and I think, you know, yes, the, the work is primarily on, on me to do, but I, I, I want to do that stuff based on the, quite frankly, amazing community that I, I have the pleasure of working with. And whether that's people that organize user groups, uh, and, you know, this is actually a good opportunity for, for me to say thank you to those people who actually want me to speak at their events, because without them agreeing for me to speak at those events and be able to share uh, my knowledge and experience and, and those kind of things. And then wanting to be able to write blog posts that I know are popular with people and the people that read the blog, the people um, that have listened and subscribed to the uh, DevOps podcasts that I uh, do. You know, without those people, those are the people that really drive all of the MVPs within the the program because without people wanting to learn off 
technical experts and wanting to share that knowledge. Um, the the, the programme really doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned. So it's, really, it's a really key thing to have it. It's an absolute privilege and an honour to be included in that, uh, you know, st still fairly elite group of um, people and be looked up to someone who is a community leader. So yeah, it's a great privilege to be, to be recognised by Microsoft. Well, you know, it, it, I think that's going to be a constant thing that you'll hear from MVPs as well. It's like, we'd all do the things that we do regardless of being an MVP, you know, because mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of other benefits and let's be honest, there, there, there are great career benefits to also participating in the community. Again, regardless of MVP yeah. status of just yeah. getting involved and making connections and uh, and helping other people, it's it's fantastic. So most of us would do what we're doing regardless of, of that status. But it's you're as a new MVP, you're going to start fielding these questions. Mm -hmm. People will come to you and say, "Well, well, you know, if I want to become an MVP, well, how do I go and do that?" And and I think the the bigger story is more of you know, looking back at the career of most MVPs. Very few, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen, who are just Kind of doing their job and they're doing a little bit they feel just a little bit in the community and then they kind of somebody nominates them just because of yeah. the help they've provided and and they're completely unaware of that but usually you go back and look at the career trajectory of the individuals the path that they're on how they got involved and that speaks so much more to why they've become mvps and so you kind of mentioned at the beginning mm -hmm. you've been in tech your entire career uh, was yeah. straight, straight out of university and just kind of went into tech kind of what was your path like how did you get started and lead you to where you are today yeah so i mean career career wise um uh, i actually i actually started off uh while i was at college in the, in the uk so uk college um so that's from when you're uh, 16 or onwards before university and um, i actually didn't go to university at all, so so I have uh, no, no degree or diploma, as you might say, from a US perspective. Um, so in a lot of ways, I, I did it the the hard way. But what what that did do was give me the ability to, I, I guess, get a head start on others my own age in a lot of ways. Because while they're learning at university and, and college, I'm getting practical, real world experience. And you know, for, throughout my career, I've been a, a, a hiring manager and I will always want to speak to, if I have two people side by side um, that both look great on paper, I am always going to want to speak to the person that has more career experience because there's going to be less uplift for them to get to the level you want them to be within your organization. So, so you know, college diplomas and degrees are very important for, for a lot of roles. Um, but you can still get to where you want to be without without doing that. So, you know, if you're if you're someone watching this that is, you know, on the fence as to, you know, if you're in the UK and you don't know whether you want to go to university or not, or if you're in the the US and, and you know you're just the kind of person that's not going to excel at, at that kind of academic career path, um, then you know so I, I could definitely attest from experience that that is not the be all and end all of your career. You can still put hard work um, in and get to where you want to be. And I'm, I, I consider myself quite lucky that I was able to be uh, on a senior leadership team within the, the organization I'm in now um, by the time I was 30, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a great place to be. And, you know, some might argue that there's very few places for you to, to go after that, but, I, I was still a technical senior leader at the end of the day. I was right? going to say so that there's, like, there's plenty of places for you to go. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. It's like in, in the tech world, there are those opportunities where mm -hmm. uh, I would argue that the uh, you know, I mean, if you're if your 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 career vision is to go up through the executive, the leadership uh, uh, side of things, there are going to be fewer opportunities if you don't have the pedigree for that. It's it's just a reality, whether that's right or wrong for organizations to think mm -hmm. that way, based on instead based on experience. But within technology itself, it's pretty leveled out based on skill yeah. and value derived. And so there are those opportunities. It's uh, so I have a, my my oldest uh, my my I've got four children. My daughter uh, who's married and she's just 
got into her first tech job out of fist she finished her master's um mm -hmm. and she was a, a stem kid so it was a science kid and and is in the healthcare industry and where she looked at the various job opportunities after finishing a fellowship after graduate school and saw this job that was in technology so now she's like dad where's the best place for me to learn about power <laughs> bi and the power platform i'm like yeah i can help you child I can't. Yeah, yeah. I, she would. She used to send me her papers of like, Dad, can you take a look at this paper? And I'd read half of this where it's talking about different cells. I'm like, I can't pronounce half these words. I can't help. <laughs> yeah. Can't. Like, but this I can help with. Um, yeah. but she she said she's like, the, Dad, these jobs, there's so much more money than the other in academia and the other jobs. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Tech, uh, and she so she's really getting excited by that. But I think that's true. You know, career-wise, there's so many different opportunities in different industries and in different spaces. You can have a passion for healthcare. You can have a passion for you know other non-technical topics in industries, but then find tech roles within that to be within that the industry and find great opportunity. Definitely, and it, you know, one one of my passions outside of technology is is aviation. I, I'm absolutely. Since I've been a child, in, in the absence of ever becoming a, a pilot, because it's frankly too expensive to become a commercial pilot, yep. uh, in the absence of that ever happening, I, I've always been fascinated with, with aviation. I, had, I actually worked for an airline for a while, um, mm. just before the pandemic, um, and, and left there for, for the opportunity I'm at, I'm at now. Um, but you know that that was that was great for me not only was it a great place to work from a, a culture perspective and, and all of those great things that make a great company but but for me I was like a, I was like a kid in a sweet shop again I I got to be you know I got to be around um planes I got to be around other people that understood the same kind of stuff that I decided to learn outside of technology in, in the aviation world and I think one of the pinnacles of my time there was getting to spend, you know, three or four days airside at Heathrow Airport in London. You know, one of the biggest international airports in, in the world and one of the busiest international airports in the world. I, I had the privilege of, you know, st standing feet away from a, a front wheel of uh, an Airbus A350 or a, a Boeing Dreamliner. And I, I have plenty of pictures on my phone to attest for it. They, they come out at parties to say, look what I did. Um, you know, this is me stood next to an engine. This is me in a cockpit. Um, and, you were, and you weren't just running out on the tar tarmac with people with guns pointed at you. So you <laughs> no, by a plane. I was actually allowed you to were authorized. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I had a bag and everything. I was actually allowed to be there. Wow. Uh, and it was pretty good because what, what I was doing um, so I went on a tour um, with our cargo operations team while I worked there, and they, they had a paper sheet that they used to track the movements of what cargo was due on, when and at what time, and what time it needed to be dispatched up, and certain documents needed to sign in. Uh, and the day without, it was just a, it was about a year ago, actually. It was November last year that I did this. And it was raining, obviously, being in the UK, it was raining, it goes without saying. Uh, and this piece of paper was obviously getting wet. They couldn't write on it. Um, but, what, you know, what a lot of people probably don't know is that within an airline, m m a lot of the core work around getting a plane into the sky is actually not done by the airline. It's done by various different partners. So the cargo company that were responsible for loading the aircraft were a third party of who I worked for. So they, you know, us as an airline, we had no way using those sheets of paper to say, how was this third party, you know, how were they performing compared to what they expected them to do? Mm -hmm. So I, I took that sheet of paper back with me. I scribbled some notes on from the operations team there, and I made it into a simple app that they could record the times in electronically and then report on. So I got to go back subsequently airside, um, you know, on the tarmac, on the apron. And um, again, I was authorized to be there, thankfully. Yeah. Um, and we got to test it on, a, on an iPad. So, you know, the company used iPads. So there I am. Uh, we're testing it. We're making sure it works and we can see what we need to, all of that great stuff. Uh, made some tweaks and, uh, you know, off, off, it, off it went. So, you know, it was really, 
he was really good working in tech to be able to apply my technical experience to a real business problem. And when it comes to stuff within technology, I think that's one of the real passions I have within my field is applying this you know, huge amount of technology and services that's available in uh, Microsoft Azure to real world business problems. Uh, and I'm quite, I'm quite thankful that I, I have that blend of being able to understand the business problem and understand the technology that can, can fix it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the automation you need to get something to to work and and such like so you know quite often i'm the i'm the guy in the meeting that's got the notepad out uh where someone says a problem that they have and i you know i'm the one there thinking well if we did this did this and did that that'll probably work yeah and uh, you, you know i i never want to take that kind of thing for for, for granted because that's you know one one of the elements of everyone's individual secret sauce that ends up making you successful and everyone has that different element that gets them to where they need to be and if you if you want to work at something then you know whether it's your ability to afford further education whether it's your ability to get into a a certain role you you know find out the way to get to where you want to and that's exactly what I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to do and then uh, get to get to where I am. Um, well, so yeah, very, very privileged. You know, it's it's interesting. So you, you're working the DevOps space, and you've just kind of touched on something that. So I talk a lot. I'm a. I don't know if you know uh, W. Edwards Deming. Uh, so mm-hmm. Deming, like you know, just in time manufacturing and and productivity guy. But he he would talk about. I can actually hear his voice from his videos. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, of, of you know, optimize this system. This craggly old guy, um, but is this idea that uh, you are constantly looking for, you solve problems, you're in there in an operations mode. Well, then you're going and looking, okay, what is looking at all the data? What's the next area of improvement where we know that, you know, something needs to be done. So one of the, I have a background in technical project management, kind of where I started my career. And, and, uh, you know, I would constantly, I'd own all the front end applications for different systems and they'd say, well, go in and demo these things. And I remember having a, a conversation um, working um, for a consulting company in Sacramento, California, uh, where they wanted me to go and test out some new software, but they didn't want me to test it on uh, any production problems <laughs> and areas because they were production systems. And, yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, I remember I said, well, we can go and do these generic tests I said, but it, you know, we're not really going to see the value. We're really going to understand the, the the solution here. And I just remember when they said, "Ah, we're we're," I, you know, I spent weeks on this, and they made a decision not to go with it. And then they didn't solve the actual business problems because they were fearful of applying the new technology and testing it on the live system. And kind of what you talked about is understanding what are those real world problems that we're having and go and trying to solve those real world problems makes a big difference. But that's a big part of modern DevOps is you're like, everything is running fine, but where can we improve if something that there's not a break fix that we're looking at to go get that next to move? We're at at 75% efficiency. How do we move it to 80% efficiency and start looking at those different activities? And so yeah. it is a constant iterative experimentation. Yeah. We we actually, I think at the minute, we actually have some really good examples. You know, unfortunately, it's a, a global pandemic that's made the situation come about. But, you know, I think, I, I honestly think technology of, of all the industries out of the pandemic, um, you know, technology is still doing really, really well, you only have to look at some of the earnings reports recently from, from the, the, you know, some of the larger companies. They're continuing to make money, um, you know, which is is good. You know, so, someone will always make money in any scenario. You know, we shouldn't put, put a downer on people for, for that happening. But the organizations that have these DevOps methodologies and ways of working and best practices ingrained within them, that are in technology at the, at the minute, they, they're the ones that are coming out of this really well, I think, at the minute. You know, you, you only have to look at 
you know, the, 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 some of the providers of conferencing software, right? All of a sudden, overnight, whether it's WebEx, Zoom, Teams, you know, still Skype for some people, whatever platform it is, the engineering teams and the operations teams that support these platforms all of a sudden overnight had to cope with hundreds of millions of extra people using their tools and platforms. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that's instilled within us, within DevOps around more collaborative working, better communication and an agile approach to delivering your work and dealing with the technical debt that comes up and those sorts of things really means that, that those organizations are in a pretty good place when it comes to being able to deal with that demand. And there are other organizations which, uh, you know, you can tell just from what you see in what you hear some of the problems are with those platforms that they don't do this. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to name names, but there are some, there are some platforms that have not coped well with a rise in demand. And there are um, others, uh, you know, specifically thinking about Cisco with their suite of conferencing products, Zoom, uh, Microsoft. Uh, and Slack and, and, you know, a number of others have all done really, really well. You, you know, there's been very few outages or no outages for those providers. They've rolled out updates uh, still. They're providing new functionality, all while sometimes, in some cases, seeing their user base increase by, you know, a, at least 100%, um, uh, literally within the space of days. So that's really a testament to what value a good implementation of DevOps can bring to your organization. And that's, that's really technology agnostic. You know, I'm, I, I'm a technologist and I love engineering still, but from a DevOps perspective, it is really not about the technology. It's around the culture of your organization, the people that you have um, within that organization uh, and the processes that you have in place. All the technology really does is just start to automate those great processes that you already have. And it's that technology on top of there, which then starts to, you know, really start seeing more value uh, again on top of what you've already done. Because now we're, instead of running that process, you know, it might be a really lean process from a, a human perspective. But as soon as you automate that process, we can now run it 10 times an hour instead of twice an hour. And that's where the value starts to increase again on top of that. And, and it's really clear to see, like I said, when you look at a lot of the organizations today and, and how they've reacted to the pandemic and, and how they're able to scale massively, you can tell that they have a good story to tell ar around all of the core principles of DevOps. Yep. Well, I, I, every time I see like a, a jump in, you know, release of new features and I look at the, the jump in, in user numbers around some of these services that you mentioned, having lived in this world for, for most of my career as well, and I know that there's a lot of people that are not getting sleep during those spikes <laughs> yeah. in activity, but uh, yeah, they're, they're, uh, it, it's, they're, there's, to talk about opportunity within this space around all of these real-time services tremendous opportunities for individual growth, career growth within those segments mm -hmm. as well. Well, Martin, I really appreciate your time talking today and, and getting some of the history here. People want to find out more about you, get in touch with you. What are the best ways to reach you, social platforms that you use? Uh, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm a pretty big uh, Twitter user, so you can find me on uh, Twitter. The, the handle is Mr. Coops, uh, so that's M-R-C-O-U-P-S. Um, I also post, obviously, fairly frequently on my uh, blog as well. Uh, and my blog is m12d.com. Um, and then also I do a podcast as well. Uh, and the podcast is called DevOps Squared. And it uh, should probably be no surprise that that uh, podcast is, is all around uh, DevOps. So, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So feel free, to, uh, feel free to check that out on the usual um, channels where you get your podcasts from it's on all good providers um, so yeah those those are the three, way, three main ways and uh, you know one of the things I would add on to that is you know if there's if there's something that you think oh I, I really wish I knew how to do um, or you know it'd be really good if I could speak to someone ab about this or I could see a blog post on how to do this or I wish I could talk to someone about 
you know, this particular subject, then, you know, feel free to reach out, right? This is, this is all what the community is about at the end of the day. And um, I, I know I speak for everyone in the MVP program, uh, in Microsoft's MVP program, um, and they would all say the same, right? They would say, you know, if you need help with something, reach out to us. You know, it's, it's free, extremely powerful letters, but we're all still human. We're all still people. And helping people is what we love to do. So don't be afraid to reach out to anyone and, and ask for assistance. If it's just a chat that you need um, and you want to do that on Twitter, then that's fine. I see people interacting with MVPs daily. Um, you know, by all means do that. If you want to speak to someone, again, just, just reach out. People will be absolutely more than happy to help. Right. And if we in a common thread as well, because you well said is that if we don't know the answer, we definitely know somebody who does know the answer. And so we sorry <laughs> point, point you to somebody, you know, and uh, so yeah. that, that is uh, uh, that's a great point. So don't be shy. Reach out to the MVP community. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for your time and have a great rest of your afternoon. Yeah. Thanks, Christine. You too.